So I'm gonna talk about what we call data analytics of Facebook. And I think in the HPC community, it's referred to as data intensive computing. If you're in Silicon Valley, it's referred to as big data, but we try to avoid those big those buzzwords at Facebook. <laughs> so the, does, it, does anyone here use Facebook, by the way? <laughs> okay, okay, so hopefully some of you do. Um, our mission really is to make the world more open and connected. And so for instance, when I'm, you know, while I'm here in Chicago, uh, I can keep in contact with my brother who's inside in Seattle, who's an anesthesiologist, my sister who's an anesthesiologist also in UCLA. I'm the loser in the family, clearly. <laughs> and I can post something uh, about what I'm doing. I'm here in Pheasant Run, uh, speaking to all you good folks. So one thing I want to dive into in this talk was really how are analytics used at Facebook? Like what's, what's the driving use for data at a company like ours? And so one example would be uh, election insights. So during the during the last election, um, this is obviously a little bit old. Um, we were able to to watch trending results in real time about things that people were posting on Facebook, um, and be able to slice and dice it by different segments of the population. And this is something that's powered by the data that we have. Um, similarly, on ABC News, we were able to show trending topics that are on on Facebook. Uh, and this is again through data that we're collecting on on the website. And another area is in terms of recommendations. So those of you on Facebook see that there are posts, there are pictures that people put on, um, there's a lot of different pages you can visit, and basically a lot of content we can show you. A lot of the content that we do show you, whether it's through your newsfeed or through things like graph search or the recommendations on your right side bar of the page, are powered by data analytics. Um, and just one more area of data is in the use of experimentation. Uh, and we do something called A-B testing. So A-B testing is a framework in which we're able to try different algorithms and roll different features onto the site and do this in a way in which we can actually measure meaningfully from some, some small population in Facebook and some small demographic what the results of those experiments are. So for instance, if we make a change to the newsfeed algorithm, is that going to boost messaging? Is that going to increase sharing? Uh, more likes and more comments, or is it going to cause a negative impact uh, on our site? And so data is just one of those products that produces uh, the ability for us to test in that way. But data is really the core of what we're doing at Facebook. So it's powering a whole swath of other things, such as product insights, so the ads that we show you, the, the pages we recommend, and also the, the platform and the, its, its adaptations to what people are doing on the actual site. Of course, we're doing things like ads targeting to uh, make sure we can keep the lights on and, and pay engineers a fair salary. Um, there's also the newsfeed, as I alluded to. So newsfeed is actually a very, very uh, well curated and well uh, uh, studied uh, piece of our core infrastructure in which we try to make sure we show you the best content possible. So the average Facebook uh, user actually gets something like 1,500 pieces of content a day. And most of you, hopefully most of you are not actually looking at all 1,500 pieces of content every day. So we try to actually rank that information and show you the most relevant things first. So you can get in there interacting with the best stories and the things that you know, matter to you. There are recommendations, as I mentioned. And graph search is a really interesting product for us, uh, a way for us to, to search not the web necessarily, but to search what's going on in, in your lives, in the lives of people you care about. Um, and finally, data is the core of what we're doing with site integrity. So how do we block out spammers? How do we prevent you know, link farms equivalents inside of the social network? And Facebook continues to grow. So we have more than 1 billion users. People are sharing lots and lots of content on the site, uh, whether it's photos or posts. Um, and we are also uh, pretty heavily invested in messages as well. And so all this content has to be stored somewhere. And I'm going to go into some of the details about how we do that. What we have is basically the warehouse. And I'll talk about a little bit as, as a history lesson. Um, by the way, feel free to interrupt me at any time, because this is kind of a higher level over. If you want to dive into specific topics, we can also do that. But before 2007, I mean, Facebook was a very small startup, way before I was there, actually. And we start off with relational databases as a way to store all our data. Um, as you can imagine, as the site grew and grew, it, two things happened. One, it became very expensive to use these relational databases, and two, they just couldn't handle the load, actually. So in 2007, basically, there was a transition made to Hadoop. As, are you guys familiar with Hadoop at all? No? 
a little bit, maybe, okay. So Hadoop actually is, um, uh, I'll, I'll discuss a little bit later, but basically Hadoop is just an interesting idea of making parallel programming easy for the masses. Fault tolerant, data distribution, all these hard problems that are looked at in things like MPI and HPC, uh, and making it available to many more people than it would be normally, than this safe in this room, and maybe this, the HPC community at large. So we moved this way towards Hadoop, and in four years, we started building around this ecosystem. So we had this idea of a logger um, on the website itself. So you can actually specify, for instance, some category. It could be like photos. It could be like some clicks on a, some likes on a photo. It could be, you know, basically anything in Facebook. You can find an event and parameters. This framework is actually what's sent into our data warehouse periodically. We created something called Hive. Hive is essentially um, a SQL layer built on top of MapReduce. It provides very, very scalable SQL on huge amounts of data, like terabytes data sets, uh, at the fingertips of anybody in the company. Um, we have uh, over 1,000 daily active users within the company on Hive. And you don't need to be a computer engineer to do it. You could be in HR, for instance. Um, we also have complicated system, uh, monitoring tools um, for making sure things are working correctly. And um, finally, we have uh, a way of doing different kinds of pipelines in the system. So I think a lot of the focus in parallel computing is really around the fun parts, which is building applications, um, squeezing out performance out of uh, existing infrastructure. But something that I, I think uh, you know, we, we look at in industry a lot is how do you build a whole pipeline ecosystem around it? How do I take my data from, say, the site itself, if I'm logging it, putting it into the data warehouse, doing some transforms on this, and then uploading it to another service, which then does some more transforms or some other analysis on it, and then producing basically feedback to the site. And do this in a regular fashion while meeting SLAs and things like that. Fast forward three more years, and we have um, new frameworks that we built in Facebook that inter interoperate with the ecosystem that's already there for Hadoop. So one of these is Apache Giraffe, which I'll focus on in the next talk of this um, of this series, and um, the other one is called Presto. Presto is basically um, an interactive SQL layer. So taking the same idea where we have basically provided SQL on top of MapReduce, except for SQL on top of the data warehouse, while ignoring some of the issues with MapReduce, and then some trade-offs. It basically allows for low latency access by, query, by analysts at kind of a human response time. So you can say scan a petabyte of data in just seconds. So just to give you an idea of the scale that we're dealing with, um, and these numbers are a little bit old, but uh, still, you know, re re recent, relatively reasonable. We ingest more than 600 terabytes of data per day into the data warehouse, and we're taking that data and processing over 10 petabytes of it every single day at Facebook. Our storage system, uh, our publicly released number is we have over 300 petabytes of storage, um, and that will grow to an exabyte very, very soon. Uh, every day we have analysts that are digging into this data. Uh, not only the data we take for pipelines and transforms, but they want to go ahead and query things and figure out real time ad hoc, you know, what's, what does this look like? How many, how many photos are being uploaded for this country on this particular day, for example? And in 2014, we also brought, a, brought about a global data warehouse. As you can imagine, 300 petabytes is a lot of storage and a lot of data. So we used to only have one data, one, one data center. This is really nice. It was easy for us to do things. Um, but as we grew beyond a single data center, things became very challenging. So now you have multiple data centers, and we have data moving around from different places in the world. And you have to be able to compute that data, you need to join that data. And sometimes you have dependencies that result in a lot of data replication and copying. So what we built is um, basically a replication system and a namespace aware kind of a global namespace aware uh, architecture in which we have allowed compute to migrate from one data center to another. Suppose you're in the ads team, uh, and um, often what happens is you maybe outgrow your compute needs, and we need to move you to another data center. We can do this seamlessly um, by replicating your data over. It's all immutable, and then you can do your computation there, but mostly without you knowing it and being aware of it. And this provides us the flexibility to be able to grow at our needs. As we add new data centers, as we grow existing data centers, as we have new applications and products, we can then uh, find places in, to fit basically um, these needs within different, different areas of the world. 
All right. So today, how does data ingestion work today? So basically, sometime nine hours ago, I guess, I, um, I checked in at the Pheasant Run Hotel. What actually happened? Um, this information went and uh, logged the photo itself into a system called Haystack, which is our photo store. It also, this entry also went into something, our MySQL database uh, just right away and returned as soon as, it could, as soon as it could. But also we have a system called Scribe, which is basically a logging framework, which took, uh, which generated a log line, which says, here's your user ID, here's a photo, and we're gonna dump it into log storage. Once the data hits log storage, after it's aggregated for some time, we then have a process called copy or loader, which takes this data and dumps it into the warehouse. At the same time, we're accessing MySQL and we're scraping that data and moving it to the warehouse. So what you have here essentially is a combination of um, log data plus kind of user data being joined together in the warehouse where we can do lots and lots of analysis. Okay. So core analytics. Our basic stack in, and our, the majority of our use cases is on top of Hive, Corona, and MapReduce. Um, sorry, and, and HDFS. Not to be confused with HDF5, although they look very, very similar. Um, typically the way this works is people are building pipelines, again, as I mentioned. So for instance, a search, search team that's working on graph search will have the social graph in some, say, Hive file or Hive, um, Hive table. Uh, we, by the way, we operate everything in terms of Hive. So Hive is basically this idea that we kind of wrap a relational database without all the hard parts, like the atomicity and replication, things like that, uh, atomicity and consistency and, and acid properties, basically. Uh, and we do it on top of the, the big data infrastructure, which is Hadoop. And it allows you to create uh, tables and partitions. There's uh, a meta store for storing metadata. Um, and it takes, again, these, you, you issue some SQL-like query, it's like select star from blah, count this, group by something, and it composites into MapReduce jobs. Now those MapReduce jobs are executed on top of something called Corona, which is our implementation of MapReduce, uh, which I'll get into a little bit uh, later. It, it's basically gonna do things like job scheduling, it's gonna do resource management, and it all works on top of a system called HDFS. HDFS is, I wouldn't call it a parallel file system, but like a distributed file system, in, in the sense that uh, maybe people here are familiar with. It's not, its intent is not to make you know, a single write really, really, really fast, but rather to be able to sustain lots and lots of writes simultaneously at high speeds. Um, and the model is very different. So the model in HDFS is, uh, is basically everything is immutable. You write once, you can't rewrite that file, you just have to uh, delete it, or you can just create a new file if you want to. And this is the warehouse, the way we've, we scaled this infrastructure to basically 300 petabytes. And that's because we can make some, some assumptions along the way that, are, that make it a lot easier for um, handling metadata and data and, and data reliability. We also have um, real-time stream processing. Obviously, we can't wait uh, for our analytics to go through the process of getting to warehouse if we need things right away. And so as we get that log storage, you can, we send the data directly to a system called Puma which is on top of HBase. We actually can do real-time aggregations um, that are, for instance, powering those CNN insights that I showed you earlier within a minute. And then that data is also being sent to the warehouse so it can be analyzed further and joined later. So some of the trade-offs between real-time versus batch processing is the fact in real-time you can do things like approximations, um, you can ignore some drop data, um, and uh, it doesn't really matter that much because in the long run, you'll have the batch result later. It just takes maybe some time for it to get there. So things like real-time streaming will produce application insights, such as, um, say I was rolling out a different, a new app, uh, like for instance, uh, Facebook paper, if you're familiar with that, or, or Slingshot. And I could, for instance, see real-time, what are my uh, active users for daily active users, uh, weekly, or monthly, and see that as I roll out new features, which is incredibly valuable. So as I roll a new feature, I try some new algorithm, I can say, well, that didn't work, I need to roll back to the previous version, um, or I can at least track like, uh, you know, the growth of my application as soon as I want. Um, we have several other systems for real-time analysis, though. So one of them is called ODS. ODS is basically a countering and metric system, which has a key value store. So the key would be something you care about, like say jobs completed per second, 
and the value is essentially some kind of number. But, and, and there are essentially uh, monitors on every single machine running at Facebook. This allows you to capture metrics for your particular application for your particular service. And ODS is used, uh, it's pretty critical at the company. What it does is allows us to deploy new infrastructure, new software, and it will be the one tracking the metrics and counters. It, you can put up alarms for various things, like for instance, if I haven't processed any jobs in the last half an hour, wake me up, you know, call me, uh, send me an email, uh, do what you gotta do to, to get me to fix this problem right away because the site's probably going down and we're gonna be in TechCrunch tomorrow. Uh, we also have things like Scuba, which is a BI tool. Um, Scuba allows us to collect uh, data, again, through logging, but slice and dice at real time. What that means is that I can um, you know, analyze my data via group buys and orders. I can actually do SQL type queries on top of real time data as it's coming through the system with late latencies of less than say a millisecond. And um, for those who need fast answers, and we're talking about not computer scientists, so product engineers, business analysts, PMs, data scientists, we have something called Presto, which I talked a little bit about earlier. Presto skips the whole MapReduce implementation that Hive has, and it implements its own distributed SQL execution engine. Now, it makes certain trade-offs being, to being low latency. For instance, um, there's no recovery of query, uh, query failure. So if a process dies in the middle of it, you just rerun it again. And the trade-off, again, is you can do things like have approximations for the answers you're looking for as a way of speeding things up. I mean, for instance, you know, if, if you're willing to take some tolerances on, on, on your approximation, you can improve query speeds by an order of magnitude or even two orders of magnitude, depending on the data you're querying. Okay, so graph analytics. Graph analytics is an area that is probably more near and dear to me because I worked on it um, even before I got to Facebook. But graph analytics is, is an area which we're trying to do analysis on the social graph, or really any graph, uh, but primarily for us it's the social graph. It allows you to do things like um, think about page rank type algorithms, uh, clustering, machine learning, counting my mutual friends, um, lots of different uh, applications that you just really can't do with any kind of other infrastructure. And so for that, we have the draft platform, which will be the next talk. And it runs on the same schedule that runs on Hadoop, which is our Corona implementation. And the advantage of this is really that you can leverage the same operational infrastructure that you have for both MapReduce and for draft. Um, and that saves a lot of time and effort for us. And this still is on top of HDFS and Hive tables. So if we look at this as kind of, oh, I see, yeah, that's right, sorry about that. One more thing, Scribe. So a Scribe's logging data to, H, H, uh, to Puma and, and Scuba is also sending data to HDFS, as I mentioned earlier. But what's happening is that we actually have data pipelines, which are running in the data warehouse constantly. Um, some of these pipelines have very, very tight deadlines. If we don't make them in time, we lose money, we have to pay people money. So they're pretty critical to the company. We also have uh, graph processing, which can be used with data pipelines or can be standalone applications. And we have Presto for interactive query. All right. So what are the scaling challenges that we face at Facebook? You might think, you know, lots of different things. And we actually are storage bound, which is interesting, but not in the way you might think. And mainly we're storage bound because we're running out of storage. With 300 petabytes, um, I mean, that gets very expensive very quickly. Uh, so one of our main goals is in terms of optimizing the use of storage. And there are lots of trade-offs you can make uh, between CPU and storage, one of them being things like compression. Um, that's something that we work very hard on. So one of the ways we looked at how to improve and optimize our storage usage is to look at the data itself. So in, high, in terms of Hive, we have, again, these tables and partitions. Partitions can have, um, we consider them age, so I generated this data you know, today, it's, it's a day old or whatever, 60 days ago, it's 60 days old. And you can easily see that there's a correlation between the number of accesses per day and how old the data is. So when you take that into consideration, you can easily think about you know, the fact that data actually has a life cycle around it. And we can, we can right now characterize this in kind of three different areas, which is hot, warm, and cold data. So in terms of hot data, we usually generate data at three times replication in HDFS, which is pretty expensive, right? So we're using three times the space that's required for 
uh, you know, 1x the data. But in, in that case, we can actually get better performance because when there's a failure on one machine, there's no reconstruction. You just use another replica. And also, you can take advantage of locality, which means that if I want to schedule a task to do some data processing on that particular machine, then I have a three times chance versus you know, a one time chance that I'm actually going to get data local. But as the data gets less hot, and as we don't care about querying it as often, then we move into a warm data cycle. And in that warm data cycle, we, you know, we expect some queries here, some queries there, but not, ne not nearly as, as much as we would expect in the hot data cycle. So we can start moving towards things like read solemn encoding. And that's more like a 1.4x replication cost, which is much, much cheaper. And as data gets really, really old, you know, months or years old, we can think like, eh, probably no one's going to access this for a while. I don't know how many of you look, from, look at your post from four years ago or something like that. Uh, we can stick that in kind of cold data. So make it more expensive, find cheaper hardware or other ways of making the data even, even cheaper to store, but maybe take longer to get to. All right, so and there are three, kind of three areas we can play around with this, and that's replication. So things like erasure coding or, or, or a number of copies that I have for particular data. I can think about the storage format, and we can also think about the storage uh, hierarchy as well. So here we'll focus on the format. So Hive uses something called RC file, which is row columnar file. It means that if you just take this table with columns A, B, C, D, we basically have a file on the right, which provides some synchronization information, a header, and we're writing out uh, these columns uh, as shown in the, in the picture below. Um, and what we've done, one thing we've done is actually look, at, look a lot at column encodings. So for example, if we just take a look at the uh, action column. You have uh, strings representing like posts, comment, et cetera. But to represent those strings is obviously very expensive. We can use dictionaries um, by creating indices and, uh, and then remapping these actions and strings uh, into the appropriate index. So there's something called ORC file that we work with Hortonworks on, um, which is, I think, supposed to stand for optimized RC file, not just ORC. Um, and this provides uh, a pretty good uh, use of um, resources. In fact, we find that strings take up more than 80% of the storage space in Facebook. It's pretty inefficient. People still do it. People like it. Um, and, but you know, this dictionary encoding doesn't work for every single column. And it's hard to tell which column's up front. So what we generally try to do is something more adaptive. We try to create a dictionary up front for a little while, maybe for the first couple hundred thousand or a million rows. And if that fails, we just say, you know what, forget it. We'll go back to just storing them as strings. And with this adaptive encoding, we move from basically 5x to 8x compression. Um, but this is really all about a CPU to space trade-off, right? This is pretty expensive to do these dictionary encodings. This is happening every time we do writes. Um, and then when we do reads, we have to then uh, unencode the data, which adds more overhead. OK. So our requirements for reads and writes are they just need to be fast. Pretty much everybody else's requirements for reads and writes. Um, what does it translate into? So uh, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Most of this stuff at Facebook is written in Java. Now, that may scare some of you. Um, but I will say that, you know, for better or worse, the decision was kind of made for us before we started working on this. Once we had moved into Hadoop, that's written in Java. And the whole ecosystem in Hadoop is basically around Java. So it's pretty hard to get away from, even if you wanted to. That being said, I actually enjoy writing Java code very much. But you have to deal with things like memory management. Um, there are ways to work around it. You can actually reach into Sun and use these unsafe methods to malloc and basically free your memory on your own if you like. But those are kind of reserved for the very critical sections of code and the tight inner loops uh, that you're writing. But these are the kind of things we need to think about. And then also lazy operations, uh, which means that don't deserialize data unless you really need to do it. Um, for instance, if you're, if you're loading data from a column, uh, if you're reading data from a bunch of columns and you're not actually accessing it, wait until the very last minute before you actually uh, deserialize that data. So with the work we did on ORC, um, I know they named it optimized RC file. We just changed the name to dwarf because it sounded like orc to dwarf. OK, that's not funny. OK, so basically, we are able to improve a lot of things. So read and write times, the compression rates. Um, it's just a win for us uh, to move to, to dwarf. 
going forward. And so these are kind of the areas of work that we're focusing on. And they have huge impact, right? So at Facebook, if we can increase compression by 50%, you just save 50% of the machines at Facebook, which is huge, a lot of money. So let's look at what that really means here. If we just simulated, we, we show these, these graphs to our, our, our vice president of infrastructure, and he started to get a little scared. Basically, it meant that we were going to, you know, something to triple our growth in like three years at Facebook in terms of storage, and he would have to fork out the money to pay for that. But with using ORC file, with sorting and erasure codes, as we applied them gradually, we were able to shift this curve down um, to that actual curve in real life. And yeah, that made a lot of people happy. Um, most of all, our people that had to pay for stuff. OK, so let's talk about compute. <laughs> um, MapReduce. I just call it easy parallel programming, or parallel programming for dummies. Uh, basically, it handles everything for you, right? So data partitioning, that's like a huge problem in any parallel programming system. Like, how do you send data around? How do you uh, manage data model? MapReduce takes care of that. Um, scheduling of locality. So we don't all have fast networks. So knowing, understanding how to take advantage of the data when it's local, being able to ship computation to data rather than the other way around is something that MapReduce does for you. And fair handling, the most important part. Um, we don't trust our machines. And when you start using more and more of them, thousands of machines, you're more and more likely to expect failures. And we don't want to wake people up in the middle of the night every time there's a failure for a particular machine. And we don't want people to have to restart their applications from scratch when it crashes because it's just using lots and lots of cores. We want it to be built into the infrastructure itself. So I know I'm so far behind. Um, let's look at the word count example. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but so for instance, I want to just count all the words in a particular file and find out the number of instances of that. I can do that so simple with MapReduce, and I can make this a parallel programming very easily. Basically, I have this map function. It has a key and it has a value. I'm basically going to take a line, I'm just going to split it by token. And I'm going to say, um, my token is my word, and, my, and I'm going to say one. So stupid. But I'm going to say one. So I have all these different uh, outputs here of this input. An elephant is an elephant. That's just five, five tokens pr produced. Now reduce, what happens is I then take that information and I just group it together. It's kind of like a group by in a, in a SQL query. So for every single key I have, it's going to group those uh, values together. And then you can just add them up. So what I end up with is an is two, elephant is two, and is is one. Now the important part about this is that I didn't have to write a single line of MPI. Right? I just wrote this very simple algorithm. And the infrastructure itself will actually do the distribution. They'll take that text format you have. They'll split it across a whole bunch of machines, as many as you like. It'll run this map function. It's going to do the reduce on as many machines as you like. It's going to handle any failures that happen. It's going to replay those things automatically. It's going to then shuffle the data to the reducers in time. Everything happens without you having to lift a finger for handling all the pro difficult problems in distributed computing. And so in the first version of Hadoop, the way it's implemented is, is basically via uh, a job tracker, which is tracking all the jobs in the system, and you have task trackers, which run map and reduce tasks. Now, over time, what we found is the job tracker was a big problem. With 4,000 plus nodes in a cluster, it doing resource management, it doing job management, it became very slow and unwieldy. In fact, it became to the point where it couldn't schedule resources in time for, uh, for our machines. Um, so our, our solution really is to queue up the jobs. Uh, that was our crappy Centrumbia solution, which was which people hated. Mm -hmm. So what it means is you get a number and you just stand in line. But this is really bad for a lot of reasons. First of all, people starting their laptops. And secondly, um, this actually breaks the scheduling policy. So for instance, if you, if you have a fair share scheduler, which means everyone should get an equal share of, of the cluster, then by queuing up the jobs, I'm kind of breaking that paradigm. You're not actually getting a fair share. You're getting a fair share when you get into the scheduling part of the system. So what we did was we moved to something called Chrono. This is our implementation of a distributed system for job scheduling. The cluster manager is a replacement for the job tracker, and it's only handling resource management. What's actually happening under the covers is that the there is a job tracker per job, and the job tracker can be run in one of two places, locally on the job client that launched the process, or inside the task tracker itself. And this allows job management to be a very distributed uh, process that is no longer constrained by a single machine. The other problems we had are multi-tenancy challenges. So you have, again, Android or 1,000 users. You have tens of teams. 
you have people fighting over resources. This is like problem in every single cluster, whether it's HPC or in industry. And how do you deal with these problems? So we have something called pools, which are something like queues. So we say every pool gets some number of resources, like you get 50,000 mappers, you get 10,000 reducers, um, so on and so forth. So we can create, and, but the problem was that teams were actually splitting up their pools into little pools. Um, so you have bi.critical, bi.sla, you know, so on and so forth. This caused problems. And so what, another question was what happens when, to those resources when a pool is not utilizing them? Who gets those resources? Um, so what we created was a hierarchical scheduler. We have the notion of a pool group, which is kind of like the overlying team at Facebook. And then within it, they can create their own pools. So what it means is that when they don't use the pools inside Don SLA, those pools flow back to another, those resources flow back into another pool inside the same team, not going to another team. Um, this is really important, actually, uh, for, for a team, for multi-tenancy. We also have something called pool priorities, which means that we can actually rank the pools. So when those resources are not used, they actually flow to the corresponding uh, pool in which you'd like them in. And we did lots of other improvements inside of Corona. So resource sandboxing, online upgrades, and restartable job trackers, which I probably don't have time to talk about right now. Um, and takeaways, Corona, which is our implementation of MapReduce, can scale to 4,000 plus nodes easily. Uh, we do more than 120K jobs per day. We do 20, more than 20 million tasks per day. And we have a whole lot of interesting problems left in, in this space, um, really hitting multi-temperate multi data understanding our data a little bit better and making further optimizations on the storage trade-offs that we can do. We also want to be able to make our namespace integration with different data centers much more seamless than it is today. And uh, final area is, in, is increasing our application suite to include things like distributed machine learning, which we're making great headway on. And with that, I do have time for two questions. Okay, we have time for a couple questions. Yeah. Yes. yes. Scope Network has had a similar problem with data storage now in your scope report. And what they decided was after, say, 10 years, they'll just wipe the data that's in your old. Do you guys foresee this for Facebook, or do you just want to keep data forever? I mean, what is your model? Or it's a good question. So, I mean, just to repeat the question is, you know, what's the data retention policy is at Facebook? What do we, do we expect to keep user data, for instance, forever? And I think that um, the data, the the reason we we keep data is for two two things. One is because um, users actually expect us to keep this data for very long periods of time. If you upload a picture on Facebook, you don't want to see it gone tomorrow, for instance, right? But what's that length of time? I think for now we think that's infinite, until we figure out a better better answer to that question. The other reason why we're going to keep data for a long period of time is because of legal reasons. So, you know, there are rules and laws about how long you you have to keep data and also get rid of data. So we abide by those laws and, and rules very closely. Questions? Uh, how are you? Can you talk a little bit about how you're storing 300 petabytes of data? Is that distributed sure. around the grid? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, the question is about how we store the data, the 300 petabytes of data. I mean, we're using this storage system called HDFS, which I alluded to in the paper, uh, in the talk. Um, you can read about it. It's, it's an open source based architecture. Uh, you have essentially a metadata server, and you have what well, we should call the name node, and you have a bunch of data nodes, which are kind of you know, just slaves that are storing actual data themselves. It is um, amazing that it scales like that, uh, just having a single metadata server, a name node server. But what we've done is created something called federations. So federations are a way of basically creating multiple names, like kind of multiple namespaces with different metadata servers. And so we have basically one instance of a HDFS uh, cluster per data center. And then we have multiple instances of this. Uh, we, then we have a bunch of, then we have multiple HDFS servers on other, on other data centers as well. So we have a system which, which actually replicates data from one cluster to another, but that's an application based on top of it. Um, most of our data is stored in Reed Solomon encoding, uh, and the, leading, the front edge data, which we, which we kind of call the most recent data, is, is stored in 3x replication. Other questions? Do you do any data backup or? Yeah, so. Um, that's part of our data life cycle is, is the data, sorry, the question is do we do data backup? And yes, we do, we do backup our, our data, that's, that's quite important actually. Um, and having multiple data centers is one way of, 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 of preventing data loss essentially. We want to be able to, like our goals are basically to survive a data center loss. Um, that's, our, that's our goal. We should maybe not survive all the data centers being lost at the same time, but at least one of them. I mean, there are real, there are real reasons for that. For instance, the event sandstorm that, um, or the, the hurricanes that come up and, and, and Sandy and all those things, like um, 
Facebook was used during that time as a, a communication tool to find out if your relatives were doing all right. And so we want to make sure we can survive those outages. We need to make sure that we're a service that's always up and running. Any questions?